So, as a witness to those, uh, as as a corporate witness to those in this city and around the world, that we stand for the truth of your word. Father, we pray that you'd help us to understand what we're teaching this evening, to apply it, and the, it's an area that is true for many of us to one degree or another. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Open your Bibles with me to 1 Samuel 28. 1 Samuel 28. Now, as I've said in the last several lessons, as we go through the end of 1 Samuel, we go back, the author takes us back and forth between David and then Saul, David and Saul, and we've traced David up to a point where he is down south with the Amalekites and about to uh, defeat them as the sort of the final part of his test in his preparation to be the king. And I've circled back around and we're back in chapter 28 talking about what Saul is doing at this time where David is fulfilling his responsibilities and he has been seeking God's guidance we have Saul seeking the guidance from uh, Nephilim. But there's a lot going on in what Saul is doing that doesn't necessarily meet the eye. So we're going to take a little time as we go through this to talk about these things. And what we see is that Saul desperately wants to know what God wants him to do. He is in a serious panic mode. Now, he's operating on his sin nature. It's very clear that he has been in rebellion against God. Earlier in chapter 15, remember uh, Samuel, when Samuel rebuked him and told him that God was taking the kingdom from him, uh, it was because of an act of disobedience on Saul's part. He had failed to kill the uh, uh, all of the Amalekites and to wipe out every man, woman, and child and all of their all of their animals. And Samuel's comment was that disobedience is like the sin of witchcraft. So he's gone from acting in rebellion, which is following the paths of Satan, to becoming actively engaged in uh, demonic activity. But he's not engaged in demonic activity per se, like pr probably a lot of people. He is engaged in the demonic activity, the seance, because he wants to know God's will. God has shut down all communication to Saul, is not telling me anything. He's already communicated it via Samuel. God it doesn't do repeats, as uh, some of my teachers said over the years. And so he's, God is silent, and that's true. There are times in history when God is silent. He was silent between Malachi and Matthew, and the, actually the appearance of our Lord. He is silent during this age in terms of direct revelation. He speaks only through his word. And God was silent to Saul, but Saul seeks guidance through the prophets, dreams, visions, Urim, Thummim, nothing's coming through. So he decides he's going to go find a necromancer to bring Samuel back from the dead so that Samuel can tell him what God wants him to do. So he's not in denial of God. He's just doing the right thing in a wrong way. And it shows the complete meltdown that occurs when any of us gets mired in carnality, when there's no recovery, there's no confession, we're not moving forward, and we're just stuck in a mode of rebellion. And that's what happens with Saul. He is at a point of collapse. So what we're going to see tonight is part of that dynamic, and we're going to see how Saul's fear leads to failure. And that's true for any believer, that fear is foundational to the orientation of the sin nature. And whenever we are operating on fear, it is always uh, contrary to trusting God and to God's plan. And so we have to learn to address the fear with Scripture, trusting in the Lord. And that's the only way to counter it. We have to move through that fear. So we're uh, looking at this tonight, continuing the necromancer of indoor, looking at how fear leads to failure in verses 3 through 8 of 1 Samuel 28. 
Now, just to reorient to what's going on, this is the map of the southern part of, of, um, of Israel. Down here in this circle is Ziklag, where uh, the, uh, David and his family and all of his men and their family are, are uh, headquartered. And then up here is Gath. All of the uh, Philistines have gone north. David initially went with them. And that's kind of the scenario right now uh, at this same time. And then the army, uh, army of the Philistines will go north from uh, Aphek. Is that right? Okay. No, no, from Aphek up across through the pass at Megiddo into the Jezreel Valley, otherwise known as the Valley of Har Megiddo or Armageddon. Har is Hebrew for mountain, the mount or the tell of Megiddo. And Megiddo is the city that's on that. Uh, this is the uh, trading route that's called the Via Maris or the way by the sea. And Megiddo was an outpost fortified city that was located there. So this is about trade. If, if the Philistines can take control of the Jezreel Valley and the trade route, then they can charge a lot of tolls and taxes and make a lot of extra money. So uh, that's what it's about. Here we have Mount Gilboa where the final action will take place. The Philistines set their camp at Shunem and Endor where the necromancer is, is located is just north of the Philistine lines behind their lines. So Saul's got to go behind enemy lines in order to contact uh, this, this witch. So what has happened is Samuel has died, and so there's no communication uh, from God to Saul anymore. Uh, we're also told in that verse that Saul had put the mediums and spiritists out of the, out of the land. The word for medium is the same word that's used for the witch, a necromancer from the Hebrew word ov. Uh, the Greek Septuagint translated it in gastromuthos, but ov is the Hebrew, which is a, uh, it's better to always use the Hebrew word when you're dealing with the Old Testament. And then the other category was the uh, Yidioni, would be spiritists, those that somehow had a familiar spirit. Also, that would involve contacting the dead. Last time we looked at how this pair of words, the Ov and the Yidioni, often appear together and they are prohibited. And then I went through the doctrines showing how the Bible teaches that that demonism is associated with false religions and false gods and we move through these various passages showing that uh, that in the um, in the scripture the these false religions just don't occur in a vacuum they're not simply something that man has come up with they are in fact the result of demonic demonic powers and we saw that at the end in first corinthians 10 20 to 21 where paul says rather that the things which the gentiles sacrifice to demon uh, the gentiles sacrifice they sacrifice to demons and not to god and i do not want you to have fellowship with demons so there he's making it clear that even though uh, they may not be aware of these demons in the background the reality is that when they were sacrificing to demons they were sacrifice i mean sacrificing to idols they were sacrificing to demons and that as believers you can't drink the cup of the lord and the cup of demons you can't have the fellowship there there has to be a break you can't partake of the lord's table and the table of de demons in other words you can't operate on pagan viewpoint and divine viewpoint at the same time there's no way to blend them or to assimilate them uh, them together and then I concluded last time by going back and showing that the ultimate issue here is getting guidance. Saul wants direction. He wants guidance. And it's about getting revelation. And I pointed out that there's two places in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy where you have these tests. How do you know when somebody comes along and says, God told me to say this. God told me to take you here. What are those tests? And that you find them in Deuteronomy 18, 
And that's where it ha- the prophecy has to come true a hundred percent of the time, not 95, 98, but a, a true prophet of God is not going to have a false prophecy. In Deuteronomy 13, you have the same thing that you have the uh, uh, prophet or a dreamer of dreams come along and gives a sign or a wonder. And it may be something that genuinely happens, a healing, a miracle of some sort. It's not just some sort of sleight of hand, but it is a genuine miracle. And God says that in verse 2, the sign of the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods. See, his content, let's go worship other gods, is contrary to revelation. Doesn't matter how many miracles the guy does, doesn't matter how many people are healed, what matters is the content of the message. And so if you go to a healing service somewhere or somebody claims that God spoke to them, the issue is, does their content fit scripture? And if not, just get away from there completely because they are in uh, carnality and in rebellion against God. And the ultimate issue here, as stated in Deuteronomy 18, 18, is that God ultimately will raise up a prophet like you, like Moses, from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. That's what God is saying. So the issue in all of this is to remember that, that revelation, divine, direct divine guidance has been cut off to Saul and he's desperate to know what God wants him to do. Now, he's already heard it. God said, I'm going to rip the kingdom from you. But he wants to know what to do in this situation because he is scared to death of what the, uh, what the Philistines are going to do. In Psalm 96, 4 and 5, which I did not cover last week, we read, For the Lord is great, Yahweh is great, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all other gods. And that word feared is used in the positive sense here of respect and awe and reverence. It's that, I've used this illustration before, it's that fear that a kid gets when the parents, the mother says, wait till your father gets home. And I heard that only once or twice or five or six times as a kid. And I knew, oh, that was it. That, I was in real trouble. And so there is this fear that is on the border of, of being afraid, but there's also this recognition of, of reverence and of respect because you know that you've done wrong and there's going to be accountability. So f- God is to be respected and feared above all these gods. And the word there for Elohim uh, is used there, but it's referring to the gods of the nations. And the gods of the nations, the pantheons, the the mythological gods, uh, Zeus and Aphrodite and Apollo and all of these other gods and goddesses. And in the Middle East, it would be Baal and El and Ishtar. All of these gods and goddesses, he says, are idols. Now, if all the gods and goddesses in all these religious systems, and that would include all the gods and goddesses in all the world religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Shintoism, whatever, uh, 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 Islam, if all the gods and goddesses are idols, and Paul says all the idols are just a front for demons, then the conclusion is all the gods in all the world religions are demons, are influenced by demons, and it's all demonism. Islam is demonism. It's just pure satanic evil, like this imam. Maybe you read about, um, read this news story yesterday. Some imam out in California uh, prayed that God would annihilate all of the Jews because of this uh, controversy going on around the Temple Mount right now. That's just pure evil, pure anti-Semitism. And uh, all of this is evil, pure evil, Hinduism, all these false religions and all their false gods, all of the false religions of the ancient world. So this is a dogmatic universal statement. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, 
But the Lord made the heavens. Notice the distinction there. Yahweh made the heavens. You know, not these gods. and You read these ancient myths. There were two, two of these gods or goddesses that had some fight in, in some of the stories, and one killed the other one, and their body was used to make the heavens. You know, what we have here is God making the heavens. He's totally separate from his creation. He's not part of that creation like these gods are part of the creation and their body is used to make the, make the creation. So that brings us up to where we are. Verse 4, we read, Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together and they camped at Gilboa. And here's the map again. Uh, Shunem being located uh, just to the due north of Mount Gilboa, all in the Jezreel Valley here. Notice this little shadow here. That's the ridge line. It really opens up here as you come around. And then here you have this ridge line where Gilboa is. We're going to look at that in, uh, in just a minute. We'll see a picture. Now, when Saul sees the Philistine army, here's his response. He's, he's, he's afraid and his heart trembled greatly. Now, I want you to think as we go through this and we talk through what's going on with our Lord's emotion at Gethsemane on Sunday morning and see how there's this difference in how that emotion is handled. Saul saw the army, he's afraid, and his heart trembles greatly. That doesn't mean he's having a cardiac arrest. That's not talking about his physical heart. He is fearful, and this is talking about his soul. The heart in the scripture talks about the core of a person. So this is talking about his inner being, his soul, and he is scared to death. He can't think, he can't operate, and so he's making just horrible decisions because he's making emotional decisions. He's no longer operating on truth, he's operating on error, and often what goes with that is people just respond emotionally and do what their emotions are dictating, and that's what's happening with Saul. The word there for afraid is the word in the lower left corner, Yara, which is the basic word for fear, has a range. It can refer to respect in one sense, but it also refers to uh, terror, to being afraid, to panicking, to being in a state of anxiety or terror. All this is loaded in that one general word for being afraid. And then the word trembled, which applies to heart, his inner uh, person, his heart quakes harad is the uh, harad is the hebrew word meaning to tremble be afraid to be completely agitated he can't think he is so upset it has voided his thinking processes and all he can do is just 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 do whatever he thinks might happen so he's going to go do something which he never would have done as a young man he's going to go visit a a necromancer now later after the necromancer brings up Samuel, and she, she doesn't do it, but God causes Samuel to come up from the grave. When that happens, and Saul is talking to Samuel, in verse 15, Saul says, I am deeply distressed. So here's a third word to describe his emotional condition, and this is the Hebrew word sarar, which means to be pressured. He is under that external pressure of adversity, and he is feeling it. He is converting it into pressure in his soul, in distress in his soul. He's going through profound personal anguish and turmoil, and he is completely terrorized by this situation. So what I want to do is look at this whole teaching on fear that we have in Scripture just hitting some of the high points, reviewing some of the things that we've covered before and we're teaching because this helps us understand we have a perfect illustration here uh, in Saul of what happens when we give ourselves over to fear. 
very famous saying. I've heard it attributed to Patton. I've heard it attributed to other people. I think Patton's probably the one that, that said it, was don't take counsel of your fears. And what that means is all of us become afraid at times. There are many things that we can be afraid of, uh, some illegitimate and some legitimate. But don't let your fear tell you, determine what your course of action is going to be. Don't listen to the fact that you're afraid. Determine your course of action so you end up making a bad decision from a position of weakness. And that is often what happens to people. So I want to talk about fear. And fear is approached basically and broadly from two perspectives. One is the perspective of pure human viewpoint uh, experience or mysticism, whatever it is, and the other is what the Bible says about fear. It's helpful to understand what Scripture teaches us about fear. And so I happen to run across this quote. This is from uh, a woman here who is actually from Houston, and I went to high school with her, and she's a big New Age guru, spiritualist, written a bunch of New York Times bestsellers, and it's just horrible horrible stuff. And she says, love is what we were born with. Fear is what we learned here. Is that what the Bible says? Not at all. The Bible says that we're born fearful because of the sin nature. We don't learn fear. It's our condition as fallen, corrupt sinners. And love is what we have to learn, but that can only come as a fruit of the Spirit in the church age. In the scripture, we have two key verses that I think should be coupled together in understanding this. In Genesis 3.10, this is immediately following the, the fall. God comes to spend time with Adam and Eve in the garden, and they run and hide. And when God calls them out, Adam comes to him, and God says, well, why were you hiding? And Adam says, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. Now, that shows that that's the first mention of an emotion in the Bible. It's fear, and it comes directly after the fall, and that tells us that fear is basic to spiritual death. Fear is basic to being a fallen creature, totally separated from life. We're cut off from life. So we're, we're, um, as it were, flopping around with no life source anymore. And that leaves us in a soul condition of, of fear, anxiety, and that's what Adam and Eve recognized. Then in the New Testament, in 1 John 4, 18, John says, there's no fear in love. Now, I remember having a conversation with Gene Brown about maybe 18 or 19 years ago, and I brought this verse up to Gene, and Gene just looked at me. He said, that's amazing. He said, everybody thinks the opposite of, of love is hate. But what you're showing me is that the opposite of love is fear. That's right, because fear is generated by what? Fear is the generated by pure self-absorption. When, it's, when you're totally concerned about yourself, the byproduct is fear because you're not the source of life. And so you can't love when you're afraid. When you're, especially if you're, and this is what, what um, Adam recognizes, they're not just afraid of some incident or circumstance, they're existentially afraid because they have lost life. Now we don't know quite we don't have that experience because we're born dead. We're born spiritually dead. And so we're born in that condition. He had come from a status of perfect happiness and perfect joy. And all of a sudden, God unplugged his life plug, and that he felt what it meant to go from spiritual life to spiritual death, from perfect happiness to to that, uh, where he's totally divorced divorced from God. We'll come back to look at Genesis 3.10 in a minute. So let's start off by looking at a definition of fear. 
and I'm going to quote this from the Oxford Eng um, yes the Oxford English Dictionary. And first we have the noun fear, and then it's also it's what's called a verbal noun. I can be fearful. I you can have the verb don't be afraid or I fear, but fear is also a noun that de that describes that action. So it's a verbal noun, and so as a noun it describes an unpleasant emotion caused by the threat of danger, pain, or harm. It's a feeling of anxiety regar regarding certain circumstances and situations, and it is a realization of the likelihood of something very unpleasant or unwelcome happening. The verb means to be afraid of something, to feel anxiety on behalf of something. And then there's a unrelated meaning that's the second way in which it's used in the scripture, but that's not the topic of this study, and that is that fear is used in the sense of reverence or awe or respect. So we're just talking about the negative emotion. Second thing we observe is that fear is at the core of a spiritually dead person. This is what we see in Genesis chapter 3. Turn with me in your Bibles there because I want to talk through a couple of things that we're going to to see here eventually. Okay, so fear is at the core of the spiritually uh, dead person who's separated from life and he's experiencing this existential dread that's at the core of who he is. And a lot of people fear a lot of different things. In fact, I did a little search on the internet to come up with the top 10 fears that, uh, that people are afraid. And, and I saw different lists. They all tend to have the same 10, but they have them in different orders. So it just depends on what day of the week you ask some people the question. The number one fear is the fear of flying. Who knew? Not my fear. Okay, I've been flying since I was like three and a half years old and never, it always seemed normal to me. But for like 40% of the population is afraid to fly. Second fear is what? Fear of public speaking. I hated that when I was in school. Who would have ever thought? God must have something to do with it. Fear of heights, fear of rejection. I know that's important for a lot of people, and several of these, I think, are related. They could be bundled together. There's a fear of rejection, a fear of intimacy, um, a fear of being alone. I think all of those connect with one another. There's a fear of rejection, a fear of intimacy, as I said. There's a fear of death. There's the fear of insects and bugs. That always makes the top ten. Insects and bugs. What's missing? What's missing? Fear of insects and bugs and? Snakes. Snakes. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, fear, fear of insects and bugs. Uh, then there's the fear of the dark. I think my mo when I was a little kid and I was be afraid of the dark, my mother had me re memorize Isaiah 41.10. Fear of the dark, uh, fear of financial failure, uh, fear of deep water, not, not metaphorically, but just deep water and drowning. So that's, uh, those are some of the fears that most people, many people focus on. But all of that comes from this, this soul condition that is basically fearful. As I've seen, you've seen it many times, and I've used the diagram on the sin nature, the basic orientation of the sin nature is arrogance, which is self-absorption. And the basic emotion that that generates is fear because we, can't, we know ultimately we can't solve whatever the problem we sense is in our, in our basic, basic nature. Fear is closely associated with d distress, worry, anxiety, depression. These are some sinful sins that are generated probably by fear. So there's this tight connection that we see in the scripture. And fourth, what we learn from scripture is that fear motivates us to solve itself, to solve the problem of fear through fake solutions. Fake is such a popular word right now, so instead of using false, uh, use fake solutions, fake doctrine, we could come up with a whole new vocabulary uh, related to fake news. So let's look at Genesis chapter 3 and just think through what is going on here uh, dynamically in the passage. 
Uh, Genesis chapter 3, the serpent has come along and has uh, tempted Eve, and she's eaten from the fruit, and then she took her finger, and she called to Adam and said, I've got something good for you, and so he ate the fruit, and therein lies the doctrine of the fall. And so the result of that, when he ate at the end of verse 6, verse 7 says, then the eyes of both of them were opened. Once they ate, their eyes are opened. Now, the text doesn't say explicitly what it was, but it's something at a metaphysical, existential level happened at that instant because they're cut off from the life source, God. They become spiritually dead, and they're separated from God. And so at that instant... All of a sudden, they, I think the eyes opening in Scripture, all, the eyes often represent uh, mental perception. And if your eyes are closed, you're not seeing things. If your eyes are open, then you're seeing things. All of a sudden, they have this experience of sin and evil and what spiritual death is. And everything had changed at that instant. The eyes of both of them were open. And a result of that is that they knew... They knew that they were naked, okay? So first of all, they ate. Result of that, their eyes are open. They become aware of their spiritual death. And third, they know that they are naked. And that's not just physical lack of clothing. I think it's an existential exposure as a result of now being spiritually dead. There's nothing that, that that can help them. They're separated from God, and they are totally exposed. So it's not just physical. I think it also has a psychological and spiritual connotation there. So they are exposed. They're they're naked. So you have eyes opened. um, They're naked. And then we read, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So that's a summary of what the happened. Now that took a little time. That didn't just happen in five minutes. They realized that what's happened, they're spiritually dead. They realize they're naked. What are we going to do about this? We're just all exposed. What what are we going to do? Well, let's solve the problem. We got to cover up. And they have to think, how are we going to do this? We're going to sew fig leaves together. How did they know how to sew? How did they know what to do for a needle? Where did they get the thread? Have you ever thought about that? That indicates that that's at least something that God may have taught them during his times in the garden. Not for making clothes, but for something. For making shelter, who knows. But they had this idea of, of sewing and needle and putting this together, and they somehow put these leaves together. I doubt that they used a needle and a thread. Sewing there probably just means manufacturing some kind of a, a covering with the fig leaves. And they cover themselves up. Now, the next thing that happens is they hear God. They heard God the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the impression here is that when God comes in the cool of the day, this is something that is normative, that God did this every day, and they had a time of instruction about the creation from the Creator. And so now God shows up, and when you read this, it says, uh, When they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves. So first they covered up, and then they hear God, and they hide themselves. They've already, it seems, created these these garments. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam, where are you? Now God isn't asking this question because he needs to find them. He's not playing hide-and-seek with Adam and Eve. He's using the question to get them to think about what's going on. Why are they where they are? Why are they hiding? They haven't hidden before. What's going on? He's saying, why are you hiding from me? Why are you, uh, why are you there? Where are you? And 
listen to Adam's response in verse 10. He says, so, I, so he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now let's think about the progression of action in that, in that verse. He heard the sound of God's voice, and, and he hid. But he already knew he was naked. Okay, so hearing the sound of God's voice isn't what makes him naked or makes him afraid. He's already afraid. I heard your voice in the garden, and in addition to that, not as a result of which, in addition to that, I was afraid because I was naked. Once he discovered he was naked, he was afraid. Fear is that base existential emotion of the fall and of the sin nature. So that's my point, is that, that when we're not walking with the Lord, the default position is not only going to be arrogance, it's going to be fear. The only way to deal with that fear is to trust God and to grow to spiritual maturity because love, the love of God is, in, that's displayed in our life is what is going to counter, and that's the only counter to the fear. So fifth, in fear, we put our focus on real or imagined dangers. Now, does Saul have a real danger or an imagined danger? Well, for a long time, he's been dealing with imagined dangers, hasn't he? He's been thinking that David was out to kill him, so he's living in his own little psychotic world. But now he has a very real danger, and I think he realized the difference that the Philistine army, Saul probably had 3,000. That's how many he took to go against David several times. So uh, uh, the Philistines outnumbered him. They could have outnumbered him as much as three or four to one. And so he's scared to death. And in fear, he's now putting his focus on a real danger, but sometimes we put fears on imagined dangers or consequences or calamities. So in Saul's case, it's a genuine danger, and he doesn't know what to do. He's just moved right into Panic Palace, and he is pressing all the bad buttons because he does not know what to do, and God's not talking to him. What we learn from the pattern that we see in in Saul and in others, is that the more things that we surrender to fear, the more things we fear. When, you, when we get involved in sinful patterns, the more we indulge those patterns, the more we want to indulge those patterns. And that can apply to any number of different sins. And especially with fear, the more things we fear, the more things we will, uh, the more things we will fear. And as that happens, over time, it builds a great capacity for fear. We just can't see the truth or relax anymore. It makes it more and more difficult to claim promises and to trust God because now we're mired in a pattern of panic and fear. So the seventh point is that the extent to which you surrender to fear, the greater your capacity for fear. So it, it becomes a self-replicating cycle where we become more and more fearful. If you give yourself over to hatred or vindictiveness, the same thing happens. It becomes a self-replicating pattern. Many mental attitude sins function that way. The more you indulge them, the more you build that capacity, the more you're going to indulge them. So the eighth point, as you build your capacity for fear, you increase the power of fear in your life so that fear controls you. It's that tenacious power of the sin nature. And that's exactly what's happening with Saul now. He can't see the truth at all. As a unbeliever or a believer gets more and more mired in carnality, it destroys their objectivity, it, it destroys their ability to clearly think about and analyze their own circumstances and situations and they begin to think in totally unrealistic manner, which is what's happening with, with uh, Saul here, but he's acting on it. He's trying to find a necromancer so that he can call up 
uh, call up Samuel. And this is just the kind of thing that we see over and over again in our own lives. But there's recovery for the believer. We can confess sin. God cleanses us, and we start getting back into the Word where the Word washes our soul, and we can recover and get out of that. But if you don't have the Lord, if you don't have Scripture, if you don't have any truth, then there's no, no place to go. There's no alternative. The ninth point is that the biblical solution to fear is faith. It's trust in God. That is what we see foundationally all through the Old Testament. For example, we saw it in Psalm 56, 3 and 4. Remember the circumstances? I won't put you on the spot. Psalm 56, where's David? David's with Achish. First time he went to Gath. And he's, he's captured and uh, his enemies expose him. So he is praying to God, calling upon God to deliver him in Psalm 56. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? Fear puts its focus on the details of life and the circumstances and situations and on the emotions, whereas faith puts its focus on God and on God's character and God's word. So that presupposes we have to know God's word, I mean God's character, and we have to know God's word. And if we haven't, as David says, if we don't hide God's word in our heart, then we're just going to keep sinning because we don't have those promises to claim. Psalm 91, David puts it this way, praising God. He says, he shall cover you with his feathers, using the image of a hen or an eagle, covering its young and protecting them. And under his wings, you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. What is his truth? Well, put scripture together. Scripture is God's truth. So his truth is is your shield and buckler. That's what protects us, is the truth of God's word. That's what builds that fortress that strengthens our soul, is a knowledge of God's word and a knowledge of the truth. Then he goes on in verse 5 and gives the result of that. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. So you can have real courage, real spiritual and moral courage that would inform battle courage, the courage in life, and that comes from trusting in God's word. So what we see as we get into this and go into the next passage, the next verse in verse 6, so when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord doesn't answer him. He's in panic palace and he's wanting God to tell him what to do, which is what happens with a lot of believers now that they've gotten themselves into a horrible mess. God, why don't you tell me what to do? And they think they can show up in Bible class two or three times and they can get an answer or they can just open their Bible. My favorite is a person who closes their eyes, open their Bible and they look at it and you know they're told to go by the river Parbar and they don't know what that means. So they're totally lost. See, you have to have the Word of God in your soul, and that means regular daily reading of the Scripture and then the daily study of the Word and uh, being in Bible class, making that a priority. So, because learning the Bible is what teaches us how to live and how not to live. So, Saul goes, would inquire of the Lord, so that tells us that he knows where the answer lies. But he's so mired in his own version of the truth and in the lie that he's told himself, because that's what happened back back in chapter 15, that, that he's going to God, but he's doing it his way and not God's way. Just like a lot of Christians do, like a lot of people do, they think they can go to God um, on their own terms. And so he's going to the Lord, and the Lord did not answer him either by dreams or by Urim, which is a, were stones, the Urim and Thummim were stones that the high priest had. They were uh, affixed 
to his ephod that was the sort of a vest that the high priest wore and we don't know exactly how they functioned we don't know if they glowed for you know one for yes two for no or red and blue or vibrated we have no idea how they functioned but they gave answers they gave specific guidance david is getting guidance through the urim and thummim through the high priest through uh, abathar that's with him either by dreams or by the urim or by the prophets and so the question we ought to ask is what was Saul's solution he's got a problem what's his solution He's going to God in prayer. Is that a right solution or a wrong solution? That's a right solution, but he's doing it wrong. Okay? He knows where the answer is, but he's still going to God on his own terms. So that's where it becomes wrong. It's a right thing done a wrong way. And this is so hard for so many Christians today to learn, is that there's a, God has a right way that things should be done, and a wrong way, and so many Christians think that they can approach God on their terms. So what Saul does is he sends out his men. He says, find me a woman who is a medium. Uh, language there is, it, it's sort of the idea, a woman, a possessor of an ove. Okay, so in most of the time, a possessor of an ove was a woman and not a man. If it's a man, it would be tr probably translated a wizard. It's not, doesn't mean that, that men weren't involved, but prim most of them in Scripture were women. Isaiah talks about some prophets, false prophets that were that way. He said, find me a woman who's a medium that I may go to her and inquire of her. Now, when Saul was younger, as we read earlier, at the end of verse 3, he had put the mediums and spiritists out of the land. So they're not supposed to be any in the land. And now he says, well, go find me one. Well, what's interesting is in verse 8, we read that um, at, the, or at the end of verse 7, his servant said to him, in fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. They knew right away where she was. So that tells that it was kind of a fake cleansing of the land, maybe, or at least or by this time they've, they've come back or something like that. So here's a couple of pictures to talk about the area where we're, uh, this ridge line in the distance here is the Gilboa ridge line. And this is Mount Gilboa on the far, far left. So this is looking across the uh, valley of Esdralon. And I ran across this picture that I had, and this is was taken in the 1880s, and this is the Arab village of Indor, out in the middle of that, that area at the time. And it probably didn't look much different from that at the time of Saul and David. So that gives you a, this is, this is not downtown Manhattan, okay? It's pretty a rural village. So Saul says, find me a woman, a necromancer, and one who practices ove. And so I'll, we'll come back next time. I don't want to get into this next section yet, but we'll come back and get into that. And the main part of this was Saul's little uh, a charade where he disguises himself and goes to her, and we'll get into the main part of it uh, next Tuesday night. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things, to recognize that there's, uh, th there's a reality to the spirit world that demons are alive and well, Satan is alive and well, and that uh, they are seeking to attack and to destroy your plan. And Father, that there are these false religions and false philosophies that are energized by Satan and the demons so that they reflect this demonic and satanic thinking that is always at odds with the scripture, always contrary to your word. And Father, as believers, we are affected by the world. We hear it. It surrounds us. We hear the messages all the time, but we need to inoculate ourselves with your word the only way that we can be truly protected 
against the lies of the world is through your word. And Father, the only solution to the fears and worries and anxieties we have is your word and to trust in you. And only as we grow and mature in love, and your love is produced by God the Holy Spirit, are we able to get beyond fear as a motivator to where your love is the motivator in our lives. And we pray that you would challenge us with the importance of growing and maturing in love so that we can ex realize the, the great blessings that we have in, that you have for us in spiritual maturity. And we pray this in Christ's name, amen.